All right, looks like we're ready to go again. Uh, this is uh, this is a presentation of probability rules that I would like you to learn for this class. These are important to learn for any statistics student so that you can understand what's going on later on when we talk about distributions. Uh, it'll help you understand some details of p-values, power, alpha, things like that. We're going to learn three rules, and, or, and not. I'm going to go kind of quickly, and you can pause if necessary to review. There's the addition rule that describes how we figure out probabilities of one thing or another thing happening. So that's why it's called the or rule. It helps us figure out probability of this or this. There's the multiplication rule, which helps us figure out the probability of two or more things all happening in the same sort of sample frame. So the probability of this and this happening, or this and this and this, etc. There's no end to the number of ands that you can have as you might have seen with the birthday problem on the ors either. So the complement rule is even simpler. It just says what's the probability of a certain thing not happening, of a certain probability or a certain event not happening. Let's review the types of events that we've talked about. You have disjoint events and non-disjoint events. And non-disjoint events can be further subdivided into independent and dependent. The or rule that we're going to learn, the, the addition rule, is actually just a simple special case, um, a simplified version of the general OR rule. The general addition rule applies to non-disjoint or disjoint events. However, for this class, we're just going to focus on the rule that applies only to disjoint events. It makes life a lot simpler. And then the multiplication rule we learned, the AND rule, applies only to uh, independent events. There is a, a more general case multiplication rule that applies to independent or dependent events, but we're not going to focus on that one. I don't even think we're going to talk about it in these lectures. Now, the not rule applies to everything. And in, in fact, it's simpler, so let's talk about the not rule. If the probability of some event, let's say event A, is some value, like 0.5 or something, then the probability of event A not happening so the, if, if the probability of event A happening is a value, then the probability of event A not happening is 1 minus that value, which makes sense. Because in the whole universe of things that could happen in this problem, there's only really two possibilities. Either event happens or it doesn't, right? So if it happens, then it has that probability. If it doesn't happen, it's everything else. This applies to any individual probability, and there are some different notation techniques that we'll use as we go along. Sometimes you'll see a line over the event like A with a bar over it, sometimes you say tilde A. Now I see, I've seen tilde A, that's fine. The superscript C, that works too. Whatever works. So the probability of winning a raffle, let's say it's a very simple, easy raffle, only five people bought tickets. So the probability of that is 0.5 of you winning it. You're one of five people who has tickets. 20% chance. Really good odds for a raffle. Uh, so we could say all the possible outcomes are this bar, and we can use kind of a bar chart to tell you the probabilities. So the probability of you winning is one-fifth of that bar, 0.2. Well, then the probability of anything else happening, you not winning, in this country we call that losing, would be 0.8. So 0.2 and 0.8 equal 1. 1 is everything that could happen, right? So 1 is all the possibilities. So we could put little 0.2 blocks for all the different five people who have the uh, raffles, or the raffle tickets, but we don't need to. We just say 0.2 is you, then 1 minus 0.2 is everything else that might happen. So the probability of you not winning, or the complement of you winning, is 0.8. So 0.8 is 1 minus 0 0.2. 0 0.8 is just everything 0.2 is not. Every things that happen, and everything else that could happen, they all have to add up to 1. And so we just take advantage of that. So some quick examples. Let's say event Y is uh, that she says yes to somebody's proposal. And for some bizarre reason, we happen to know that the probability of that happening is 0.7. So the probability of the complement of Y, in other words, her saying no, would be 0.3. Because 0.7 and 0.3 together make up all the possibilities. Either she says yes or she doesn't say yes, logically speaking. The probability of winning this game, let's say it's 0.2. What's the complement of that? That would be 1 minus 0.2. That would be 0.8. So 0.2 and 0.8 make up all the, all the possibilities that are available here. The probability of throwing a fit at bedtime, actually, it's probably much higher than 0.4. But let's say it's 0.4. Uh, then the probability of the fit not happening, probability of not throwing a fit, is 0.6. 0.4 and 0.6 make 1. 
So more relevant to statistics, we sometimes talk about the probability of a type 1 error if the null hypothesis is true. So I'm folding in some conditionals in there because this is a conditional thing. But we'll say alpha is the probability of a type 1 error occurring if the null hypothesis is true. So what's the probability of a null hypothesis or of type 1 error not occurring if the null hypothesis is true? Well, it's 1 minus alpha. So if you set alpha at 0.05, then the probability of not making a type 1 error if the null hypothesis is true is 0.55. If we send alpha, set alpha at 0 0.9 or 0.01, then the probability of not making a type 1 error if the null hypothesis is true is 0.99. So pretty good odds. This is why we set that alpha kind of low. So the special addition rule, moving on to the next one, is that if you want to know the probability of one thing or another thing happening, as long as those two things are alternatives and as long as they're disjoint probabilities or disjoint events, um, disjoint events outcomes and you know, we flip-flop those terms a lot because the concepts flip-flop the probability of either of those happening either one this or this is just described is just calculated as the probability of one of them plus the probability of the other one as long as they're disjoint because that's the only way everything adds up to one so let's say event a uh, you're standing in front of the mines of mordor and you've got a defeat like a troll or something to get in there and if you're all 12 or higher on your d20 for this strike then you hit the troll and you'll probably hurt the troll and you can keep fighting and you're not going to get hurt right well there are this number of ways to get a 12 or higher one two three four five six seven eight nine there are nine ways to get a 12 or higher on a 20-sided die which is called a d20 so the probability of that happening of getting a 12 or higher is nine out of 20 nine things we're interested in 20 possible things that could happen so that's 0.45 let's say if you don't hit the troll but you roll a three or lower then for some reason you can run away and dodge whatever the troll throws at you so you still won't get hurt so that's the probability of that is three out of 20 because three or lower three two one those are the three or lower on a 20-sided die and that's 0.15 so either way you're kind of safe something good happens to you or nothing bad happens to you so what's the probability of nothing bad happening to you well these two disjoint events either rolling a 12 or higher or a three or lower 0.45 plus 0.15 you add them together it's 0.6 there you go and those are disjoint outcomes which is the only way this works they can't happen together so here's another example i don't know if you've ever seen hunt for red october 90s movie spy movie anyway jack ryan aka alec baldwin as a younger man is pursuing the soviet sub with sean connery driving it who is very soviet and russian for some reason in this movie uh, but the sub doesn't know they're back there because they're kind of in their sonar shadow where they can't see. I don't know what the movie says. I don't know if any of this is true or not. So at one point, Jack Ryan says, you know, 50% of the time in these situations, that Soviet captain is going to pull a crazy Ivan, which means he's going to turn his sum around like quickly and suddenly 180 degrees and look behind him with sonar. And that is bad because then they would see the Americans following them. So I'm going to mess with the plot a little and say, what if... Jack Ryan, the analyst, knows that 5% of the time, instead of doing that, he would just fire torpedoes backwards, and that's also bad. Because torpedoes bad underwater for subs. So uh, let's say those are disjoint, and the book can't both happen. He's going to do one or the other. And so we're trying to estimate that probability of what's going to happen. What's the probability of something bad happening? Well, it's really easy. If the probability of a crazy Ivan is 0.5, and the probability of torpedoes being fired is 0.05, then the probability of either one happening is 0.55. This only works if those two things are disjoint, if it's if it's not possible in this scenario for them both to happen. So if he can't turn around and fire the subs all of, or fire the torpedoes all at the same time. And I'm assuming he can't because otherwise it doesn't make a good example. So another example of this special multiplication, oh sorry, that was the addition rule. Moving on to the special multiplication rule. Um, What's the probability of tossing two coins simultaneously and getting heads on each coin? So you toss two coins, what's the probability of heads and heads? Now this only works for non-disjoint independent outcomes. There's the special multiplication rule that works for independent or dependent outcomes. It's a little more complicated. You have to add in a, prob a conditional probability. We're not going to worry about that in this class. Well, let's say coin A is a fair coin and it comes up heads half the time. 
So probability of, of event A, which is coin A being heads, is 0.5. Coin B is not fair. It's a cheater coin. It's, it's loaded. So it comes up heads only 25% of the time. So the probability of B coming up heads is 0.25. Well, A and B both coming up heads is both of those things multiplied. And when you multiply probabilities because they're proportions, they're numbers between 0 and 1, then the result is smaller in general than it would have been otherwise that if they had been larger numbers. So in this case, smaller than both probabilities. So 0.125. So you only have a 12.5% chance of getting heads and heads in that particular situation. Because those were independent outcomes, you can do this. Because the probability of coin A coming up a certain way does not influence in any way the probability of coin B coming up a certain way. Now, if you're playing with somebody who's an extreme cheater, they might not be independent. So you need to keep an eye on your cheating friends. So here's another example. Let's say the events are rolling two six-sided dice. Let's say you're playing some kind of complicated two six-sided dice board game, and you can win the game if you get a 10 or higher on both dice added together, and one die is a six, exactly a six. Now those are actually independent because if you take one die being a six, then actually they might not be totally independent. Let's, I haven't thought through this carefully. Let's pretend like they're independent. And if anybody can figure out how they're not independent, go ahead and tell me because that would be interesting because I'm not 100% sure anymore. They seemed independent when I wrote this lecture. So what's the probability of rolling a six on one? And then if you roll a six on one, then you have to roll a four or greater on the other so that the total equals 10 or higher, right? So you need a six and you need 10 or higher. So it boils down to you need this. One of the dice needs to be exactly a six and then the other one needs to be four or greater. Um, actually, I am ignoring some dependencies. Let's pretend I'm not. So the probability of rolling a six is one sixth, which is 0.167. Actually, it's 0.166666. So usually we round probabilities off to two decimal places just by convention, unless you need to go further to demonstrate something. I went one extra deci decimal place further, so because it's a repeating decimal. Um, and the probability of re rolling a four or greater is 0.5, because four, five, or six, 0.5. Those are three possibilities. So both of those happening, you just multiply those two probabilities and you get about eight and a third percent, 0 0.08. So here's another example. Now this example is a little bit more uh, complicated. It does work, I can tell you this, but it involves some conditional probabilities, as you'll see. But we're going to kind of gloss over those conditional probabilities because the math, you follow the same procedure here. So let's say about a third of applicants for a particular job are given interviews. And as far as you know, everybody's pretty much the same qualifications as you. And as far as you know, because of your ignorance, everything's random. Ignorance makes uh, random a pretty good way to guess. Since you don't know anything different, you might as well guess randomly. You don't know why they're, why a third get interviews and why a third don't. Of those who get interviews, one-fourth are offered the job. Of those one-fourth, one-half are offered the job, or who are offered the job actually take it and start working for this company. So what's the probability of you taking the job if you apply and go through the whole process? And if everything's truly random, which it might as well be because you don't know. You don't have any idea how things really work. Well, the probability of getting the interview is one-third. The offer is one fourth, 0.25, and taking the job is 0.5. So you can figure out this probability by saying all of those things, all of those things multiplied by each other. So technically, this is a conditional probability, but you figure this out the same way with this straight chain of conditional probabilities. It boils down to being an and problem. What's the probability of the interview and the offer and taking the job? So it works out to be the same way. So anyway, those are some examples of working out and problems. I'll try not to throw any really clever ones at you on exams. Uh, let's play which rules should you use. So don't figure out the probabilities. In fact, here you can't because I haven't given you enough information. But let's say you just need to know which rule you're going to use to solve the problem. You order a t-shirt, mail order from some internet company, uh, What's and it's just randomly selected colors. What's the probability that it will be one of the colors of the French flag? Which rule will you use? Okay, here's the answer you'd use or. Because you can boil down that question into what's the probability of my t-shirt being blue or my t-shirt being red or my t-shirt being white. And if you knew the probabilities of each of those three things, then you could, uh, then you could uh, add together, figure out whether they're independent, um, disjoint, sorry, not independent, but disjoint and add them together and come up with your answer. So next, 
What's the likelihood that Rand Paul will end up in a presidential race against Hillary Clinton? Which were they going to use? Now, if you're not familiar with the way these things work, Rand Paul is a Republican, Hillary Clinton's a Democrat. Generally, uh, we end up with two main contenders for president of the U.S., and one's a Democrat and one's a Republican. So which rule would you use? Here comes the answer. You'd use and, because it's the same as saying, what's the probability that Rand Paul is the nominee for the Republicans and that, Bill, the, sorry, Bill, that Hillary Clinton is the nominee for the Democrats? That's how that would work. So here's another one. What are the odds of winning lotteries in three states at once? Which rule? Here comes the answer, and. Because you can boil this down you can rephrase this as, what's the probability of winning the lottery in Ohio and winning the lottery in New York and winning the lottery in Pennsylvania, or whatever three states you choose. How about this one? Which rule? Here comes the answer. It's or. Because this question boils down to a, uh, an, an or type situation. What's the probability of being a victim of a tornado, or being a victim of a hurricane, or being a victim of an earthquake, or being a victim of an avalanche? Now, what's the probability of correctly guessing the answer to three multiple choice questions, if there are four options for each question, and it's random because you're just guessing? It's and, or it's or. Which one? Comes the answer? It's the first one. It's and. Because it's the probability of guessing one question and probability of correctly guessing the other question and the probability of correctly guessing that third question. Or it doesn't make any sense there. So you could calculate this pretty easily. How many ways are there to be right when you're guessing one multiple choice question? Generally one, right? How many possible things that could happen? Well, if there's four options, then there's four. So your odds of guessing correctly on one question are one in four or 0.25. Then on three would be 0.25 times 0.25 times 0.25. So that's a lot. What is that, one in 64 or something like that? Anyway, it's a lot. It's a, a very small number when you're done. So don't guess on your multiple choice questions because you're going to fail. For the summary so far, probability is always this ratio of two numbers, outcomes of interest divided by all possible numbers. Probability is always about the outcomes uh, coming from a random process or an event. If we can identify the outcomes coming from the process, then we can identify which of those are of interest for the problem and which are all possible. We divide, and there we go. We have a probability.